Horror fans, welcome back to 237 back with another review. And getting ready for the month of October, which what I have planned for that is to finally finish up the anthology collection that I started like two years ago. And since I haven't done too many, go through some Stephen King films, which I have a handful. I've seen a bunch, but I haven't really uh, reviewed that many. And, you know, Stephen King's one of the masters of horror, so I figured I, I should do some more of his films. I figured October would be a good time. Uh, I'm not delving fully into that marathon just yet, but it is the end of September, and I don't really have anything else going on. But I figured I'd kind of start with one that I am pretty familiar with. Uh, this is actually one of the first Stephen King films I saw. Uh, King kind of served as a bridge between Goosebumps type horror and like the adult horror when I was a kid. I got really into Stephen King, reading his books and watching his movies. Probably between the ages of 8 and 10, probably 8 or 9 was when I started. And my grandparents were uh, rental junkies. They were always at the video store. So they'd always ask, do you want us to get anything? And I always said Stephen King movies. So during that period, I saw a lot. And this was one of the ones, first ones I saw. It came out in 1985, which I would say the 80s was kind of the peak for King movies. Kind of a cult film. You don't really hear too many people talk about it. It didn't do well when it first came out. But fans of 80s horror, werewolf movies, and Stephen King fans is kind of a cult film. And it's 1985's Silver Bullet. And yeah, uh, I know there's a, a Screen Factory Blu-ray out. I bought this years ago. There's actually a bunch of Stephen King movies with this kind of DVD layout. I'm not going to get the Blu-ray. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with this. But Silver Bullet, of course, is based on the short novella, Cycle of the Werewolf, which I have read. Uh, of course, th this has illustrations by Bernie Wrightson, who did the Creepshow comic. Uh, he he's worked with King a lot. Now, I will say Silver Bullet works better as a title than Cycle of the Werewolf because in the book, it's more about each full moon of the month. It takes place over a year, the, the cycle of the moons. And the marketing kind of plays out like that, like saying it started in spring and each month got worse or whatever. So it kind of plays out that way like each month there's a new kill it starts in spring ends on halloween but some of the attacks seem to be just days apart so it's not really the yearly cycle that the book is it is fairly faithful uh, to the book there are some moderate changes mostly the characters that get killed are very different from what's in the book or once in the book or not in the movie at all now, it was directed by Daniel Atias, who was not the original director. The original director was actually, I want to get his name, Don Coscarelli, who directed Phantasm. But there were some problems with the producer, uh, Dino De Laurentiis, hated the look of the werewolf, which was done by uh, Carlo Rimbaldi. He was mostly known for Aliens and E.T., but he also, he's the first effects artist to have to prove that his effects were fake in court for Lucio Fulci's Lizard and Woman's Skin. So, and, and he's done more Italian films. He also did Bloody Pit of Horror, but his, his design of the werewolf was not liked by the producer. So they shot all the werewolf, uh, non-werewolf stuff first with Coscarelli, and then he quit, and then they got Dan Atias to finish the film with all the werewolf scenes. And I will say, yeah, the look of the werewolf is not that great. It is kind of notorious for looking like a black bear, especially the up-close shots of the eyes. It kind of looks like a Akita dog <laughs> or like a black bear. But one thing that really works for this film, and I'm sure a lot of people won't like this because they like to see everything. For me, it worked. It really worked to its favor. Is we don't ever see the werewolf in like 
uh, well, one, we never see its full body, but we don't really get a good look at it until the very end, like the very end of the film. Before that, it's all shadows or up close to the claws or the eyes or the mouth or the full body will kind of be like a, a, a silhouette or up close, which I think that works. It builds the suspense, kind of the Jaws effect of what you don't see is scarier. I, I do think that works. I do like the sound of the werewolf, the, the snarls and screams that it makes. It is a bit high-pitched. It kind of reminded me of the Dino De Laurentiis version of King Kong, which Carlo Rivaldi also did the effects for. <clears throat> but uh, I will say it looks better than some werewolf movies that I've seen. Like It is a standing upright werewolf, half-man, that a werewolf should be. Not in all fours, pretty much a complete wolf like a lot of modern movies. Now, as far as 80s werewolf movies go, I would say I like an American Werewolf in London more. Uh, it's been so long since I've seen The Howling that I can't really compare it. I have The Howling, I just haven't seen it in a while. But, you know, the sounds it makes, which I know in the book, the snarls almost sound like words. Here, it's just snarls, growls, and screams, which I think work. Actually, some of the scenes when it shows the transition the transformation look better than the final werewolf or the the church scene the big dream sequence church scene some of those werewolves look better than the real one that we get and <clears throat> uh, i do know that king wanted the werewolf to be more plain and smaller than like a huge hulking monster which uh, i do agree with but anyway, uh, I will say I do like the transformation scene. When it turns back, yeah, it's just a bunch of crossfades or a dissolve cut, not dissolve cuts, but like fades, kind of like the classic Wolfman. But when we actually see the transformation with the jaw extending and the hands, and that's all well done. Those effects are good. The church scene, which when I was a kid, that dream sequence church scene scared the hell out of me and i still think it's a very well done you know i i don't really like fake out dream sequences but this one was very well done we've gone on long enough about that so uh yeah it says written by stephen king so i guess he did the screenplay as yeah he did the screenplay as well uh Stars, of course, Corey Haim, who, watching this, he was a talented uh, child actor. With one of the two Corys to be in Stephen King films. Corey Feldman would go on to be in Stand By Me. But Corey Haim, it, it is kind of sad because he is playing a good-hearted, uh, you know, kind-hearted, good-to-do kid. And he does it very well. So just kind of knowing the drugs and everything he get into and eventually lose his life, it does kind of make it kind of a sad performance. But also, a, a Megan Follows plays his sister. Gary Busey plays Uncle Red, which Gary Busey is fun as hell in this role. Uh, I know he really had fun. He ad-libbed all his lines. He did the line straight. But then he was given the opportunity to ad-lib lines in both King and I think the director really liked the uh, ad-lib take. So pretty much all the lines they used were ad-libbed. And Everett McGill plays the reverend, spoilers, the werewolf. I mean, it, pretty much well known at this point. Good Everett McGill, Quest for Fire, People Under the Stairs, Dune, Twin Peaks. He's always just a good, weird, bad guy. <clears throat> and, yeah, the movie just plays out. It's this small town in Maine. Uh, uh, Parker, uh, Parker's Mills, where people are getting killed uh, very viciously. Uh, uh, this movie is fairly bloody. And, I mean, when the werewolf gets a hold of people, he shreds them up. First death, which is a beheading. That's the opening scene. It was the town drunk, so they think it was an accident. 
But then there's this young woman in her home who is just clawed to shit. And again, all these werewolf scenes are shot either they're very up close, fast cuts, or he's obscured by something. And I think that really works. She's clawed up. Um, another scene where uh, this girl's dad is watching wrestling, which is a funny scene. He goes out in the greenhouse. And some of the scenes, like when the camera pans over, we see eyes watching, might look kind of silly. And I don't know, if it, it's probably a coincidence that it's Carlo Rimbaldi and actually had a number of Italian crew members. But the wolf reaches up, grabs the guy, pulls him down in the greenhouse, like halfway, and then pull, pulled towards this uh, plank of wood that goes into him. Kind of like the eye scene from Zombie. But uh, I love that shot because we see it down below as he's getting pulled towards this plank. And then it's a shot straight on where he just like, like his head's down. And as he's getting lifted up, he's got blood and he just kind of falls into the, love that shot. <clears throat> also, uh, the one scene that is in the book is when Corey Haim's close friend gets killed. Uh, he he has his kite. They don't show his body, which I think works. When I was a kid, I was like, well, why don't they show it? What sells it is the father's reaction when he sees the body. That's all we need to know about how horrific it is. Also, with the scenes earlier... Knowing what this thing does to people, you can imagine how shredded up he is. And it does have its atmospheric scenes. I mean, there's the private justice where all the local rednecks decide to go on these uh, uh, hunting parties. Or a hunting party to go find the guy. They're out in the woods. There's like this you know, waist high fog. People are getting sucked under. Yeah, there is an effect where a guy gets pulled under that he's kind of lifted, and you could tell it's like a, a a dummy. That looks really fake. Which also, there's the guy that runs the gas station I've seen in other movies, Lawrence Tierney, who was Joe in uh, a Reservoir Dogs. He's a bartender in this. And then we got the church scene where the, the reverend's doing a funeral for everyone that died in the fog. And everyone's turning into werewolves. Again, th those ones look better than the one we got, but still. And just the way that shot, uh, it kind of gets like this wavy, hazy type look. But the way we just see everyone transforming, it looks really creepy. Then the lights go out, the church organ player kind of doing this crazy thing and blood's coming out of the piano very well uh, i still think that scene holds up which there is artwork of that i don't remember the context in the book uh, necessarily but yeah obviously they don't look that good but it's still probably the scariest scene of the movie and that's pretty much the first half. It It is a very well-paced movie, but the first half is very heavy on the werewolf attacks. And again, some of them feel like they're just days apart instead of one each month. And then the second half is when Marty, again, who's Corey Haim, kid in the wheelchair, he's out shooting fireworks that his uncle red got him and his uncle red's an alcoholic and he has all these funny lines which it, in the book he does that for fourth of july in the movie it's in october he's lighting off fireworks werewolf comes up he shoots the bottle rocket uh, up in its eye and then it's pretty much almost like goosebumps where him and his sister are trying to figure out what to do and then they have to pull in a, a trusted adult that believes them to an extent which is Gary Busey so like the first half is very heavy with werewolf attacks then the second half is 
them knowing that it is the reverend and what to do next. Which, there is kind of this long montage where when I was a kid, I was like, all right, I get it, move on. Where the sister's doing this bottle drive and she's looking for someone with one eye. That's kind of her way to get around town. So every scene when it shows someone, it does like this crazy close-up of their eyes. Only to reveal that the Reverend has an eye patch. And going back now, it is kind of obvious that it's uh, uh, the Reverend. Obviously, if you read the book back then, you would know it's him. When I first saw it, I wasn't expecting that. But <clears throat> watching it now... It's like very obvious that it's him. He only comes up during funeral scenes. Uh, the private justice scene. He's trying to stop everyone from going out. And, and even the way the scene is set up. Like he's back to talking to the sister. You only see like half his face. Then the camera kind of pans over. The The music. the, the Which the music was done by. Uh. Jay Chataway, which that name sounds familiar. I don't know if I've seen anything. Uh, Star Trek. Oh, he did. Uh, the original Maniac, uh, Silver Bullet, the, a Maniac Cop 1 and 2. Okay, so I have... The main theme kind of reminds me in the beginning to the theme of Taxi with Andy Kaufman. But the scenes with the werewolf is kind of like this Jaws, like... Which, I mean, we see very little of the wolf, like Jaws. And then it just leads up to them wanting to make a silver bullet so they can kill it. And then it ends on Halloween night. Eventually... Uh, there are a couple scenes with the Reverend, like, they've been sending magazine cutout notes to the Reverend saying he should kill himself. They know who he is. He does try to attack Marty, but he stopped the scene on the bridge. And eventually, they have Gary Busey get a silver bullet made. And on Halloween, they're alone with him in their house. Werewolf breaks in. Kind of a fight, get shot in the eye, he's dead. You get one final jumps, jump scare. Which, yeah, when he transforms back, is just a fade edits. Oh, also, Terry O'Quinn, the stepfather, <clears throat> uh, he's the sheriff of the town. Which, his death, I mean, he gets a bat to the head, the, the blood spatter. That's when we get the actual transformation scene where we just see the snout grow and get really cool effects. I will say the overall final form of the werewolf in this does look better than the final form in, say, American Werewolf in London. That's another movie where the transformation scene looks better than the final product itself. Apparently they had a dance actor to wear the wolf suit during those scenes, but the director or uh, De Laurentiis was not happy. So they just let Everett McGill wear it. So he actually has a dual credit. But the cast works really well. There is really good chemistry between Corey Haim, his sister, and Gary Busey. Gary Busey's having a lot of fun. It's good to see him in these roles pre-accident that kind of messed him up. But he's having a lot of fun. I, I really buy him as just this sort of obnoxious, loudmouth of alcoholic. So the chemistry works real well. The pacing is great. You know, the first half, all these attacks. Second half is them figuring out who it is and then what to do about it. The score works. And the way it builds the suspense from not showing the werewolf, just tiny glimpses up until the very end, worked. That might have also been because they didn't like the look of it. But, you know, it, it worked to its favor. Also, scenes like when his friend is killed and they don't show the bodies, just the father's reaction. That made it more effective. Um, 
you get some nice uh, tracking shots or some wide shots. Like when we see what it does show of his friend killed, there's just the a, a dark park, a gazebo with a dim light. This has this far away wide shot where you just can't make it out, but you know it looks horrible. Uh, the sea, the seas of the woods with the fog and the church nightmare. It has its atmosphere as well. I still love that church sequence, the of nightmare scene. Just a very fun, not very talked about Stephen King film. I mean, outside of King fans, outside of 80s horror or werewolf fans, you don't really hear people talk about it too much. But I, I've always thought that it was a very solid film. Is it in my top 10 favorite Stephen King films? Probably not. Is it a top 10 for best uh, adaptation as far as just being faithful and loyal to the book? For the most part, I mean, it is small things they change. Like the the sister Jane figures out is the reverend during the bottle drive. In the book, uh, Marty figures it out by uh, trick-or-treating and sees the reverend at his door with the eye patch. And a lot of the victims are different, but it's it's a very simple premise. I mean, it, it plays out more like a slasher film, I guess, because American Werewolf in London, we follow the werewolf character as the main character, more like a, a Wolfman type movie, which I will say my favorite werewolf movie is still Lon Chaney Jr.'s original Wolfman. Which that's one one thing I can say is that this is a better werewolf movie with a better looking werewolf than 2010's uh, a Wolfman. But yeah, very solid. It's entertaining. It's fun. Anything that could have it, it it did all the right things to keep it from being cheesy, corny. Which really the only corny line things about it would be some of the dialogue, especially when they're trying to be funny outside of Gary Busey's lines. But it it's still fun, definitely bloody and, you know, a, a, a vicious when it needs to be. So that's Silver Bullet. Uh, I do have a small stack of Stephen King films to get to, a few anthologies. I will pick up some more Stephen King films as the month goes on. So uh, stay tuned for more, and uh, thank you for watching. Oh!